Zhongshan was at the eastern end of Cao Cao's defence line along the Yellow River, and it was defended by only 700 soldiers under the command of General Chen Li. Taking advantage of the favourable terrain of Guangdu, Cao Cao stationed his crack forces deep inside territory south of the Yellow River in order to hold back Yuan Shao's army. If Guangdu were lost, his last defence line would be his capital city. These are weapons used by Cao Cao's troops. These are materials used to set up their tents. Cao Cao's three lines of defence from the north to the south formed a multi-level and mutually supportive defence system deep inside the territory. In addition to having an overall plan for the Battle of Guangdu, Cao Cao was flexible in his use of specific tactics. As soon as the battle began, Yuan Shao had his general Yan Liang lead 10,000 men in encircling Cao Cao's troops in Bai Ma. In order to save Bai Ma, Cao Cao pretended to cross the Yellow River at the Yanjin Ferry Crossing Point. Cao 当年袁绍率兵严禁发扬出发时赐燕良于万军之中取其首级而回 Cao Cao's victory in the Battle of Guangdu put him in control of China's north. After the battle, Yuan Shao's situation went from bad to worse, and he had to relinquish his position as northern China's number one to Cao Cao. But Cao Cao still had other enemies. How did he defeat these enemies and rise to prominence during this troubled period of the Eastern Han Dynasty? Cao Cao was born in the year 154 AD into the family of an official in what is today the city of Guozhou in Anhui province. According to history books, Cao Cao's extraordinary skills in pursuits such as archery were recognized in his childhood. He could shoot birds and capture wild animals at an early age. He was said to have shot 63 pheasants in a single day. The empire of Cao Cao's childhood was one exhausted by domestic political disturbances and repeated invasions by ethnic minorities. In the year 174 AD, 20-year-old Cao Cao was recommended due to his piety and honesty for an official position in the capital city of Luoyang. It was his first official position, yet it was nothing less than secretary to the emperor. Xiao is Xiao Jing. Ten years after Cao Cao became a government official, Zhang Jiao from Zhulu Hebei initiated the Yellow Turban Uprising. It was a disaster for the empire, but it led Cao Cao to begin his military career. Cao Cao was working his way up to becoming the most important general for the imperial family of the Eastern Han Dynasty, when suddenly the regime faced a major crisis. In the year 189 AD, Emperor Ling Di died. A power struggle broke out inside the imperial palace. It was at this time that Dong Zhuo, who would become known to later generations for his tyranny, appeared on the stage of history. Dong Zhuo had almost all the major figures in the capital city Luoyang killed. 
He burned the Imperial Palace and all the houses within a 100 kilometer radius of the city. He then forced Emperor Xiandi and several million residents of Luoyang to move west to Chang'an. In short, Dong Zhuo threw the empire into chaos. The collapse of the Han Dynasty was followed by a period of incessant warfare as various warlords fought for supremacy. One man who managed not only to survive the constant fighting, but also to establish a position of considerable power was Cao Cao. But how did he manage it? The ancient city of Zhuzhang stands on a plain created by the Yellow River. The people of the city, old and young alike, are fond of operas that tell stories about the Three Kingdoms period. Most of these opera lovers like the character of Cao Cao the most, as they believe he was a great hero. The people here often cite these lines. Whenever I want to know more about the Three Kingdoms, I like to travel to Xu Chang. In September of the year 196 AD, something happened that greatly affected Cao Cao's fate and changed the history of Xu Chang. He welcomed Emperor Xiandi, the last emperor of the Eastern Han Dynasty, to his base in Xu Du, today's Xu Chang. This is often referred to by historians as Cao Cao having the emperor in his power and ordering the dukes about in his name. Cao Cao lived with Emperor Xiandi in Xu Du for 25 years. It was in this city that Cao laid the foundation for his unification of northern China. At the time, Emperor Xiandi owned nothing aside from his imperial robes. Why did Cao Cao welcome to Xu Du this emperor who had no real power? When Emperor Xiandi returned to Luoyang from Chang'an on July the 1st, 196 AD, he found his palace gone and Luoyang a ruined city. There being no royal venue left standing, the emperor met with his officials beside a fence. Shido 他们的人们的人们的人们的人们的人们的人们的人们的人们的人们的人们的人们的人们的人们的人们的人们的人们的人们的人们的人们的人们的人们的人们的人们的人们的人们的人们的人们的人们的人们的人们的人们的人们的人
He accepted the advice of Xu Nyu and established new political and military programs and worked on plans for economic development. But although Cao Cao now enjoyed political supremacy, militarily he was still in danger. Xu Du was located on a plain that lacked natural barriers, and it was encircled by his enemies. Yuan Shao in the north, Wu Bu in the east, Dong Zhuo and Cao Cao's former officer Jiang Xiao in the south. Cao Cao believed, however, that his most pressing problem was inadequate provisions. In the year 196 AD, Cao Cao issued his regulations on establishing farms. Much land had been abandoned around the middle and lower reaches of the Yellow River due to the war. Cao Cao realized that under these circumstances, establishing farms in and around Xudu would help to address the food shortage problem. Historians refer to this as the Xuxia farming program. Cao Cao's farms were in reality a new type of community that served both military and civilian purposes. Cao Cao himself was in charge of both the military and the farms. This is a stone roller used at one of Cao Cao's Xuxia farms. The diameter of such a stone roller could be as much as several meters. According to History of the Three Kingdoms, in their first year, Cao Cao's Xuxia farms brought in a bumper harvest, and this solved the long-standing problem with provisions and helped him in his war to unify China. Cao Cao's victory in the Battle of Guandu left him in control of China's north. However, despite his political supremacy, militarily he was still under threat. And yet, despite being surrounded by enemy forces, he succeeded in introducing economic reforms that ensured a bumper harvest. However, he still faced the problem of what to do about his enemies, some of whom were extremely powerful. To find out how he went about dealing with them, join us for our next episode about Cao Cao. And thank you for staying with us on today's New Frontiers. I'm Qi Xiaojun on CCTV International. Bye for now.